Okay, chapter 23, Managing the Great Depression, Forging the New Deal, 1929-1939. So 10 very important years in American history based on, you know, what happens in this era and brings this Roaring Twenties uh, idea, you know, it collapses, okay? The economy collapsed with it. So the realities of the Great Depression begin to sink in. The excesses, irresponsibility, frivolousness, whatever you want to call it, of the Roaring Twenties vanished. And the only question, only question left is where do we go from here? What can we do? Okay, this is a very bleak time. Brought people back to the hopelessness of World War I. Remember, we had the hopelessness of World War I that was replaced by the, by the fun and good times of the, of the 20s. Now you're back to this hopelessness again, okay? 9,000 banks nationwide closed, 100,000 businesses closed. So there's no work, no money. And this depression was worldwide. Um, it wasn't just, just in America, okay? Um, so the, so the, and the recovery was more difficult for other nations because their economies were still trying to recover from World War I. Uh, Germany still, still drowning in reparations debt. Those, that, those billions of dollars that they owed in reparations – uh, the rest of Europe, France, Britain, you know, Europe was devastated by the war, trying to rebuild your infrastructure. Now along comes the Great Depression, okay? So let's start with a film. Let's watch a crash course film here, the crash course film on the Great Depression. So go ahead and pause your video here and do that. Watch the film, then come back, okay? Okay, so who is the, the president when the uh, Depression begins? Herbert Hoover, Republican. He had been in office uh, less than eight months when the markets crashed, okay? Uh, and, and he believed, like most Americans, they had confidence in themselves, believed in self-determination and hard work would solve the problem. And he makes a, uh, a, you know, a, a comment here. Any lack of confidence in the economy – I'm sorry, let me start again. Any lack of confidence in the economic future or the strength of business in the United States is foolish. So you got to believe the United States – you got to have faith, okay? Uh, Americans should work harder and live a more moral life. This was a direct response to the lifestyles of the 20s, okay? But in truth, the problems were much deeper than Hoover thought. It would require much more than American pluck. Now, what do I mean by American pluck? Spirited and determined courage, okay? So, which is the American way, okay? Uh, but then he blundered. Then he then he made a, a huge mistake and and to help to help it all kind of come tumbling down. Okay, the, the Smoot Harley tariff was one that he was urged by many not to do, but he implemented it anyways. This is a very high tariff on imported goods in an attempt to stimulate American manufacturing, but it backfired. Other countries, in anger, including America's allies, in anger, imposed their own crippling tariffs against America. So this ended up making things worse. And it had an international effect. So so Hoover adds to the problem by by uh, implementing the Smoot Harley tariff. Uh, so he's 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 kind of at a lack of, of uh, direction. What do we do here? So he turns to the government. And this is interesting because Franklin Roosevelt, who is his predecessor, he will get the credit for, for turning to the government and providing, you know, uh, social programs that provide jobs. This, this will be a very much a democratic uh, ideology, uh, modern liberalism, and part of what's called the New Deal. But Hoover actually tries it first, okay? Hoover turned to the government to provide jobs for public projects, uh, much like FDR will do with the, with the New Deal. Um, so it's interesting. He kind of precedes FDR on this idea of modern liberalism. So what is that? What is liberalism? An ideology associated with free political institutions and religious toleration, as well as support for a strong role of government in regulating capitalism and constructing the welfare state. Okay, so that is that is liberalism, positive freedom, situation where individuals are able to pursue their personal development, self-realization, autonomy, empowerment of individuals, but but also most important, the very last point there, an enabling state. This 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 right here is very, very important. An enabling state needed to provide a social I'm sorry, needed to pro provide social conditions for everyone to enjoy positive freedom. So so a government that will enable people to uh, you know rely on them is, is really what 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 this 
uh, boils down to. Okay, so so what is the opposite then? What is what is conservatism? Political philosophy that favors tradition in the sense of various religious, cultural, or nationally defined beliefs and customs in the face of external forces for change, and is critical of proposals for radical social change. So so conservatives are the status quo. They're they favor tradition. They're happy with the way things are. They don't want change. They don't want the government to get bigger and become more involved, okay, uh, and are critical of proposals for radical social change. So, so uh, you know, when FDR comes in, it's so radical that you have you have this problem, okay. Uh, so so back, back to Hoover, the president, he was kind of seen as uh, – I'm sorry. That's, so, that, so that's our conservative slide. We believe in personal responsibility, low taxes, limited government, okay? And that's just the same ideology as today, okay? Okay, Hoover, uh, accused of being asleep at the wheel, okay, not paying attention. You you know, there, there were economic indicators showing that, that, the, that the country needs to slow down and regulate because the stock market's booming too fast. It's going out of control. It's going to correct itself. That's what the stock market does. You know, when it gets too far – too far out there and inflated prices, it'll it'll correct itself and drop. So there were indicators, but but Hoover, much like Coolidge, much like Harding before him, Republican presidents of that of that era, the 1920s, all saw the prosperity as as endless. It's post-war. It's good times. We're we're you know we're coming out of this horrifying um, time and everything's great. Okay, so so very very similar to what George W. Bush did in 2008. You know, not not paying attention perhaps, uh, and then when when it starts to fall apart, stay calm, believe in America, it will work itself out. Okay, uh, these things are much bigger than that. Many times in both these cases, that that is the case. So regarding Hoover, you know, the crash happened only eight months into his administration. So you can hardly say it's his fault. These things don't happen that quickly. But but his ideas to get out of it <clears throat> did not work. And and truly, it, the country needed more than just determination, okay? The issues were much deeper. So so people are, are on, the, on the street. People lose their homes, their jobs, their money. They have no way to support themselves. <clears throat> so you have these shanty towns kind of pop up here and there especially in big cities people people taking over a field to 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 live okay and people started calling these hoovervilles in you know to because they're blaming hoover for for putting putting them in that position many people that couldn't afford blankets would use newspapers for blankets and those were called hoover blankets the truth is these people had nowhere else to go okay and another incident that that further uh uh, ruined uh, Hoover's popularity and and uh, faith is the uh, is the bonus army. Now, what is that? It's another sh kind of shanty town that pops up around the Capitol building in Washington D.C. Now, these are World War One veterans who fought in World War One. Of course, th this is that was you know 15 or so years ago. Okay, and um, they decide you know we fought this war. We have a pension. You're going to give it to us in 1945, but we don't. We don't trust you. You're falling apart. We want our money now. We fought the war. We won the war. Many of us died. <clears throat> we sacrificed our life and limb uh, to, you know, keep this country free. So pay us right now, okay? Uh, we were the heroes in 1917, but we're bums now, okay? So they camp around the Capitol building in protest. And, and Hoover, you know, not not the smartest move he ever made, calls the army out to remove them and and to burn down the encampment. Okay, so it's a very sad day when the army is fighting with its own veterans, uh, and these were older men, these World War One veterans. Many were injured, so <clears throat> so Hoover's popularity uh, plummets. Okay. Okay, so the the depression is an important part of our story, and, and like I said last. Last lecture, the generation that lived through it were forever changed by. Then they fought and won World War II, huge accomplishment, rid the world of nasty leaders like Hitler and Mussolini, called the, and, and this generation is called the greatest generation, and they should be. But their conservative values would clash considerably, considerably with their children. Uh, it, you know, as time time goes by, these baby boomers, these these this you know this surge in, 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 in the birth of babies in America after World War II. And this would result in the conflictive decade of the 1960s, okay? Okay, uh, 
So like I said before, the, 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 uh, the uh, depression is the first step for the greatest generation. Next will be World War II, then the 50s and 60s, and then that clash with their children that, that really define who we are today, okay? Okay, so this is the era of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is where he comes to power. This is where he comes to huge popularity. And this era and his, his administration will change history forever. This is a paradigm shift. Nothing, will, nothing remains the same, okay? So as president, he guides the country through the Depression and his implementation of social programs and the idea of modern liberalism is begun. Uh, and then he also is the president through the almost the entirety of World War II. He died just, uh, just, just right before the war was over, okay? But let's go back a little to the beginning. The election of 1932, Hoover versus Franklin Roosevelt. Well, I mean, Hoover never stood a chance. The, the, the entire population of the country turned against him. They blamed him, okay? And Roosevelt seemed like a breath of fresh air, a new approach. And this is kind of how he saw it. The country needs bold, persist, persistent experimentation. So that's a new word. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't hear politicians saying, I'm going to experiment very often. They, they typically have a, a bold, you know, uh, uh, this is what I'm going to do, not experimentation. But, but Roosevelt's saying, guys, you know, we've never been here before. We don't, we don't know about this. This is the first time we've seen this. We didn't see it coming. So we're not sure what to do. So stick with, with us and we'll, we'll get through it together. But we've got to experiment, okay? We, we, we got to try new things because the old things didn't work, okay? So perhaps borrowing from the progressive era, he implements social programs to attempt to bring the country out of its slump, okay? Um, so not American pluck, right? Not, not just American determination. determination. You, you need much more than that. FDR said we need to experiment to figure this out. This was new territory for everyone, and like I said, a paradigm shift. Uh, things change completely. Things are never the same. Okay, Government will never be the same uh, after this era. Okay, so Roosevelt starts at rock bottom. <clears throat> the country's in shambles. It's, it's in dis disarray. Very similar to Barack Obama in 2008. He began his administration in a very devastated economy. Uh, but, but Roosevelt and his policies will ch will change the landscape of American politics and like I said bringing in this the idea of modern liberalism creating the endless arguments that would that still go on today between Democrats and Republicans liberals and conservatives so this is where it starts this is where the big government versus small government argument argument that we have today begins okay so what do I mean by that? What do I, I mean by big government? <clears throat> According to conservatives, big government is excessively interventionist and intruding into all aspects of the lives of its citizens. So a conservative would say, we don't need the government poking around in our business, especially if you're in, in business, you know, with regulations and tariffs and duties. And l let us just let us have a free market. OK, don't intrude into our lives. You know, if we need the government for some reason, we'll let you know, okay? But stay out of our lives. <clears throat> a, a liberal, on the other hand, would defend big government by saying it's a government designed to help the people. Some people need assistance. Some people are, are you know, destitute from the Depression. Some people are destitute because they are disabled from the war. And, you know, what do we do with these people? Do we just let them starve? Or do we help them? So social programs de uh, um, designed to help people in need. Now, what's the downside to that? Uh, it costs money, okay? And and how do you raise money? You, you raise taxes, okay? So liberals typically, you know, are raising taxes to pay for social programs to help people. Conservatives want to cut taxes, cut programs to help people, and say, you know, people need to work harder, Okay. So that's kind of the that's kind of the idea, the difference. Okay, uh, so so we talked about all the re reforms of the, of the progressive era. You know, FDR is his administration somewhat picks this back up where it was left off. Social programs to help America get back on its feet. So we remember the progressive era was going along nicely. And then World War One happened. Boom, it's over. And then the twenties happened. Nobody cared. 
Well, now you've got a, a depression and people start saying, hey, we need to pick these ideas, these reforms back up. OK, get get America back on its feet. OK, so so Roosevelt realizes that the government doesn't trust any trust uh, the president and the government anymore. OK, so he he starts a campaign to become more um, accessible to everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to put people at ease and to get them to restore their hope. So he has this idea to, to do what he calls fireside chats. And what this would be is they're going to be on the radio. Of course, there was no TV in those days. The, the radio is how everybody heard the news. And he would invite, he would invite families to, to, to get together, sit around the fire in your living room, and turn on the, the radio and listen to the president. You can have a personal moment with him. Okay, uh, this this made people begin to trust him. Now, they didn't trust Hoover. They didn't trust Coolidge and Harding. The people, you know, they, they they felt that these people weren't weren't you know of of you know fighting for the people at all. But here's this here's this nice man that wants to sit and talk to them in their own home. So this is a this was a you know turned out to be a very good thing for him. So, so you, you kind of have the precursor to TV here, right? Of course, today every president reaches out to the common man. Um, you know, it's it's what the campaigns now are all about: TV and, and internet. Okay, okay. Was there one of these chats where F, <coughs> FDR made one of his famous quotes to, to try to get people to have courage? Okay, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. All right. Okay, another reason why he did these ch these chats sitting down was because he was in a wheelchair and nobody knew it. He didn't want anybody to know. FDR was disabled from polio from a from from when he was a boy. Okay, and he didn't want anybody to know because he didn't think anybody would vote for a disabled president. Okay, uh, different times. You know, you you'd never get away with that today. But in those days, the press would protect the president, and the, the press kept this secret. Okay. Uh, interesting. I, you know, would would do we live in a in a culture or society today that would elect a disabled president? But you know, perhaps so. Um, interesting question. Okay, so so FDR and his New Deal. You know, many 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 programs. Great expense to the government. How do you pay for it? Tax hikes and inevitable in a liberal big government. But in this case, what what, what would have happened to the country without them? So it's kind of hard to, you know, argue against it on in, in some ways okay so let's look at all these um, all, all these programs and these are right out of your book um, you know in in the same order that, that they come in the book okay the first one is the emergency banking act of 1933 okay uh, a bank can reopen if it has sufficient reserves of cash prior to this the bank would remain closed in a crisis and this is what happened you have you have what's called a run on the bank people People hear about a you know an economic downturn, they they panic, and they rush to the bank in mass, and they all want their money. Give me my money, okay? I don't trust you. Of course, a bank doesn't have all the money just sitting there; it's invested in other in other investments, people's property, and so on. Okay, uh, so what happens is the bank has to close because they're out of money; they they, they give it all away. Uh, and then they're and then they're finished. So what happens? The people that, that didn't get their money out, they lose it, perhaps. Okay. Now this this idea of a run on the bank. Um, I want you to take a break here and watch the next film. Let me just kind of give you some context here. Uh, the next film is a scene from the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Okay. Now It's a Wonderful Life is always shown around Christmas. And for those of you that don't know know the movie, uh, basically it's the story of a man named George Bailey who gets the chance to look at life with the help of an angel to see what, what life would have been like if he had never been born. Okay, Because he goes through life and he's, he's you know, upset, depressed, despair, and he says, you know, everybody would be better off without me. So the angel says, okay, okay, George, we're going to show you what life is like what what life would have been like for all the people that you love if you had not been born okay so that's kind of the idea behind behind the uh, the, the movie itself it's not important to our, our our lecture but I'm just giving you a little bit of background okay so this scene that I'm going to show you is is a of course a dramatized scene of a run on the bank okay so George just had just got married his one of his best pals is a taxi cab driver and he's driving George and his his new wife you know, to the uh, 
airports that go on their honeymoon. His wife has two thousand dollars in cash, and they're gonna they're gonna go see the world, which is a lot of money in those days. Okay, so they're they're driving down the street, and then this this panic happens, and then of course, um, well, watch the film and you'll see the rest. So you you, you get get kind of an idea of what I'm talking about there. Okay, so go ahead and pause the film and watch that that film. Okay. Okay, so that so that scene is it, it you know it, it hits all the main points of what happens when a bank closes. You know, he you you see that his his competition Potter's trying to buy everybody out. You know, taking advantage of people's people's despair. Everyone's panicking. So that's it, it's a good example of of what happened in the in the Great Depression. That scene, of course, is supposed to be the day that the market crashed okay okay the next the next program is the f i'm sorry uh the f the fdic uh, yeah that's right federal deposit insurance corporation this is part of the glass steel act of 1933 uh so this creates the fdic that we still have today federal deposit insurance corporation so insurance for deposits you know, peace of mind for people so if you deposit money in a bank you don't have to be fearful that you're going to lose it. You have insurance, so you can't lose it. So you don't, you don't have to run to the bank and get all your money out, okay? Uh, next, The next act is the Agricultural Adjustment Act, or the AAA of 1933. Notice they're all 1933. Uh, <clears throat> this is the government regulation of the farming industry, and the idea was to cut production of certain commodities to lower prices. Uh, and of course, this is pretty controversial and didn't really work out. What's the result? You know, a lot of wasted food. In the middle of a depression, you have fields of rotting food because you don't want to, you don't want to flood the market with choice. Okay, so, so you know, people are hungry and you got rotten food. So this was criticized, but you know, again, desperate times call for desperate measures. So, you know, uh, Roosevelt's experimenting. Not all of them worked out. This perhaps was one of them. And of course, he's criticized by conservatives for creating this idea of big government. But but again, no one had faced a crisis like this before. So Roosevelt was fearless in his attempts to, to right the ship, okay? Uh, and he brought an aggressive approach to solving the country's problems. The next act, the NRA, also of 1933, the National Recovery Act, and this encouraged industrialists to voluntarily adopt codes that defined fair working conditions, set prices, and minimize competition to minimize cutthroat competition. And this was all nice, but unfortunately, the NRA was deemed unconstitutional because it infringed on the idea of separation of powers. Okay, so that didn't work out either. Uh, the next one, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, the FERA. Uh, what is this? Uh, also 1933, provided funds for state relief programs. Remember I talked about Hoover tried to get a program going, uh, you know, through the, through the government to create jobs. Uh, Hoover's, so what this FERA did was, was revamp Hoover's Emergency Relief Fund of 1932, and it made it federal, made it big government, okay? Uh, the PWA, the Public Works Administration, this is a big one, 1933 also. This is a huge uh, uh, act here, okay? Uh, it was also called the Civil Works Administration, the CWA. So what, so what it did was it created construction projects. It built dams, bridges, hospitals, schools. Uh, Oceanside Pier is a, is a PWA uh, you know, project that came out of that time. They, they built a pier with PWA money. They intended to spend $3.3 billion in the first year and $6 billion in all to provide employment and revitalize the economy. So so a lot of money, okay, in those days. Uh, next, next, Civilian Conservation Corps of 1933 also, the CCC. This is young men, uh, taking young men, involving them in projects, uh, it, mostly in the outdoors, reforestation, conservation projects, to get to get young men working and learning skills. So, so if they got older, they wouldn't be, you know, without a job. They'd have they'd have skills to offer. So they they built bridges, roads, trails, typically in the park system in the in the outdoors. Okay, the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, uh, 1934. So before I get into this. I kept saying also 1933. He had all these programs that started in 1933. So the point I'm getting at is that for those of you that know, when a new president comes into 
into power, starts his first term, he's always judged by his first hundred days. Okay, we just had the this last year, you know, Trump's first hundred days, and what did he accomplish or not accomplish? And where this came from is right here. Roosevelt hit the ground running, and he he started all these social programs, and most of them were started in the first hundred days of his administration. So this is where this where this tradition starts is with Roosevelt because he did so much. And ever since then, uh, every new president is, is compared to, to, to what, what Roosevelt did and, you know, what did this new president do in, in his first hundred days. Okay. Okay. So the federal uh, housing administration, uh, department of housing and urban development, uh, this is to improve housing standards and conditions provide a workable home financing system, ensure mortgage loans, and to stabilize the mortgage market, okay? So make make mortgages safer, more stable. Uh, you create uh, mortgage loans that are, that are, that are you know, easier to, to qualify for and, and so on, not so complicated. So uh, to uncomplicate a complicated uh, uh, procedure, okay? Next is the, is the Security and Exchange Commission, 1934. This is a big one, too, 1934. Pretty far, I just said, uh, to monitor and regulate the stock market. Now, what, what happened? I mean, the, the, the market tanked and nobody stopped it. They just watched it. So everybody sold out. So it, 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 was, it, it, it cratered. It was awful. It, it dropped like no one ever thought that it would. Uh, so the SEC said, we're going to close the market from now on in an emergency, such as a rapid sell-off to avoid a disaster. Now, that's what happened in 2008. In 2008, as bad as it was, it could have been a lot worse. But because of the SEC and its ability to close the market, they close the market, and they and they let people calm down and get their senses before they start trading again. Same thing happened September 11th, 2001, with the 9/11 attacks. You know, the market started to tank, and and the SEC closed the closed it, so so you wouldn't have this this rapid sell-off. Okay. Uh, the the other thing you you have two different types of markets in in it just depends on the economic times, you know, a bull market and a bear market. So what's the difference? You know, a bull market with what they had in the twenties, it's, it's just, it's, it's out of control. It's aggressive. It's moving. It's bashing through new, new barriers like a bull, right? It just smacked like a bull in a china shop. Just, just nothing stops it. Okay. But then, but then it crashes and now you have this long, uh, you know, climb back. It doesn't come flying back, okay? It comes back slow. Very sluggish and, and you know, step by step, it's a bear market. So, you know, how, how does a bear move? Very, very slow and slow and determined, okay? <clears throat> okay. Another uh, famous program, the Tennessee Valley Authority, also 33. And this, this took Tennessee River Valley – uh, in all these southern states, Tennessee, uh, Virginia, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Mississippi huge, okay? Uh, the Tennessee River is a huge waterway in, uh, in the uh, south, okay? Also with the Cumberland River, the two. But this, they, they built dams to, to, you know, manage the water to create uh, reserves of water, okay, for agriculture, so, so dams were a really popular item in the New Deal. They built a lot of dams. Okay, now what's the downside of that? When you when you when you create a dam, you're flooding a pre a, a previously dry area. So many people were left homeless because where they used to live is now underwater. Okay, <clears throat> the the New Deal didn't always make concessions for these people. Okay, then, but, but interestingly. Did the New Deal change the political landscape? Did it end the Depression? I mean, it definitely changed the political landscape, but did it end the Depression? No, it did not. It definitely put people to work. It definitely helped. But, but as far as the economic indicators, still way below average. And it, it went for the entirety of the 30s. It, it didn't really uh, come back to its its levels. So um, so what did help? What, what did save America? Does anybody know out there? Yell really loud. I can hear you. Oh my God! Someone said World War II. That's it. World War II. World War II happens. That's what what gets people out of the out of the uh, depression. That's what get, get, I should say gets America out of the depression. Okay. Okay. Um, so so Roosevelt and the New Deal. It's a big, big era here. Um, 
Uh, this, is a, this was a lot to unleash on society, but he did it tirelessly under extreme criticism from Republicans, constant criticism from Republicans. You know, conservatives yell reckless spending and reforms that are socialist. You're, you're creating a, a social state here. It's going to be the social states of America pretty soon. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's the Red Scare. We remember the Red Scare. This is kind of where, where the, second, the, the second Red Scare starts to build. Uh, and people are conservative Republicans are concerned about communism and socialism, what, like the Bolsheviks, what happened with them. So you have a huge fear of this in the pre-World War II era. So did, did uh, Roosevelt have any competition? He did. A, a very interesting man named Huey Long, uh, governor and senator of Louisiana, okay? And he ran for president against Roosevelt. He was nicknamed the Kingfish. And he became popular among conservatives, of course, the opposite of Roosevelt. And he had a very bizarre tax plan, okay? You must keep the wealth of the country scattered, and you must limit the amount that any one man can own. You cannot let any man own $300 million or $400 million. If you do, one man can own all the wealth that the, that the United States has in it, okay? <clears throat> so, okay, that's an interesting um point of view. I don't know if that's, you know, actually something that, that, that you could actually ever sell or have actually ever work. But, but again, very socialist point of view, right? It's it, you share the wealth, not, not one person, not one company. Okay. So share the, share our wealth is society is what his, what his, his program was called to punish the rich because they did it with, with their opulence and their overspending and their elegance. Okay. And single-handedly make them pay for the depression. He actually came up with a plan where he, he determined that, that rich people should be charged 100% tax. Now, now think about that for a minute, and, and you know you, you, you wonder why he wasn't elected. I mean, that per, perhaps it, you could have got some you know, popularity with the punish the rich idea, but 100%? Okay, so not really a serious threat to FDR. Uh, he, he lost in 32, and he decided to run again in 36, but then he was assassinated. So Huey Long is one of those people. We talked about assassinations before. I mentioned his name. Uh, this, is a, this is a politician that was killed in the, in, in the, by, by mixing with the American public, okay? Okay, so, so Roosevelt has lots of criticism, but the liberals on the left, <clears throat> they want more. You know, what do I mean by the right or the left? We talked about it before, right? On the left... Everybody kind of, most people are moderate, but you might lean to the left, you might lean to the right, okay? <clears throat> if you lean to the right, you're conservative, and you, you want less government. So if you keep on going further further to the right, you become a libertarian. You want liberty, but total freedom means no government. There's no government to, to supervise or <clears throat> enforce laws. What happens? You have mob rule, and you have anarchy, okay? <clears throat> we talked about this before when we talked about anarchy, but what about the left? So you go from the left, you become moder you become liberal, you, be you keep going further to the left, you become socialist. This is big government. And if it's total government, then you have communism or fascism or Nazism, okay? <clears throat> so so the liberals want to go more to the left, more government, okay? And, um, and, and that's what he does. He doesn't care about the conservatives. FDR says, I'm, I'm moving further to the left, you know, I don't care. And he starts what is called the welfare state. And this is something that we still, you know, uh, talk about today and it's controversial. What is the welfare state? Okay. Uh, these are government guaranteed social programs to help people in need or destitution. Okay. So, of course, these were tough times. So that's where it came from. But this dramatically changed the fabric of America. Now, conservatives argue that, you know, wait a minute. You're, you're by by doing by doing this, you're you're creating lackadaisical attitudes among the people. Why should I work if the government will will pay me for it? You know, um, the government will pay me more when I have more and more kids. So, you know, people take advantage of that. Do they do that today? They they do. So it comes out of this era, okay? But I mean, in this time. What do you do with people who are in serious need? There, there were people that were in serious need, like there are today. And again, this kind of goes back to this idea of social Darwinism, this idea that you know uh, only the fit survive, and if you can't, if you can't survive, then you're going to be trampled. 
and you know the the bright people with wealth and education are going to take over and everybody else will fall by the wayside. Well, that's not really an American ideal, but but that was tossed around this idea of social Darwinism that the you know that the weak will not survive and if you can't survive then get out of the way. Okay. Okay, the other the other um, item that another item that that Roosevelt implemented was the Social Security Act. Okay, now this is a very very socialist idea, a forced pension program that we still have today. So what happens? Employers deduct from paychecks, and it goes into an account, and uh, and then when a person reaches the age of sixty five. It, they get paid, you know, a certain amount of, of money for the rest of their lives. Now, understand, back in those days, 65, you didn't you didn't live a whole lot longer than that. You know, most people, you know, many people died in their in the 60s and might have gone into the early 70s. It was rare for somebody to get up in the 80s and 90s. So that the the you know the uh, uh, time of living uh, was was much shorter. Okay. But, I mean, it's an interesting idea that the government said, we're going to force you to save money, and we're going to take money from you, and then we're going to give it back to you when you retire. That way you won't be destitute. Of course, the argument is if you if you could take the money the government takes from you every paycheck and invest it in a, in a more aggressive uh, uh, investment, you're going to make a lot more money than the government will give you, but they – the government says, but people don't do that. You know, that's that's a rarity. Of course, today you have a lot more people that, that would do that, but in those days, not so much. Okay, so it was a forced pension program, so people wouldn't be starving when they when they retired. Okay, never intended to be the sole support, uh, but for people that had nothing, it it was it was something, right? Okay, okay, so 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 Roosevelt's very popular. Um, you know, he won four elections, 32, 36, 40, and 44. Nobody else had ever done that. Nobody nobody else had ever run for more than two. He, he ran for four and won four times. Uh, you know, this is um, this is unusual. So, And his ideas had never been seen. It was a direct extension of the progressive movement that had died after World War I. Assistance for people, unemployed, workers, poor people, unions, kind of come back and get, start to get their clout back. They didn't, nobody in the 20s cared. Uh, but now unions see this idea of reform and assistance, and this becomes popular. That's what they're about, right? So unions start an alliance with the Democratic Party that continues today. Most unions are, you know, back the Democratic Party today, okay? Um, what about women? How do women um, fare in the in the New Deal, okay? Okay. Um, you know, he, Roosevelt did not really address inequality of women. Uh, you know, some gained employment for his, from his programs, but not known as a pro-women president, okay? Uh, in, in his defense, his plate was pretty full. He had a lot going on. But his wife, Eleanor, and this is, a, this is Eleanor here on the, on, the, on the slide, she fought for women's rights, okay, and became a model for the independent women that would arise in the 1960s, okay? What about black blacks in the New Deal? Uh, you know, the New Deal did little to battle racial discrimination. Uh, the CCC, the, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the young men building trails in the parks, they were they segregated blacks and whites, kept them separate. NRA codes did not protect black workers. And, and this is a really interesting one here. FDR, the president, repeatedly refused to ban lynching. Now, of course, the question has to be asked. Why would the president need to ban lynching? Lynching is murder. Is not murder against the, the law? It's against the Constitution. It, it is. But lynching for some reason, and, I, and we've seen some images, we talked about it you know, before, it really became somewhat of a sport. I hate to say it like that, but that's what it was. You, you've seen the pictures of the people happily gathering around the, the uh, corpse, you know, the, whether they whether, – whether they, if they hung the person or they set the, you know, uh, the, the, the man on fire, uh, the uh, lynching of Will Brown, they, 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 they burnt him, right? Uh, it's, it's murder. So the president was urged to ban it, which, again, I can't – like, what do you mean ban it? it how do you ban it? it? It's murder. It's already banned. But, but lynching was different. It was seen, as, seen differently. So he didn't do that because he said it would antagonize other members of Congress – and their support was needed for New Deal measures. So Southern members of Congress would not would not vote for FDR's 
you know, uh, laws, if, if he banned lynching, I mean, wow, what does that say? I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty frightening idea that, that politicians would say, if you ban lynching, president, we're not, we're not going to support you. If you ban murder, I mean, really? Okay. You, you, you get my idea. Okay. Okay. So, so the truth is though, um, FDR was very popular with, with the black community. Okay. Poor blacks benefited from relief programs and they saw him as their new uh, you know, savior, like they thought that Lincoln was 70 years earlier, okay? And what happened is a very, very strange thing. Um, uh, and I'm not sure how to say it, but this, Republicans become Democrats, Democrats become Republicans. What? What, what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, black voters had been pro pro-Republican since Lincoln. So why? Because he, he freed them, right? The Republican Party freed them. The Republican Party took charge in the Reconstruction era, kind of left them hanging, but they were there and trying anyway, for, you know, initially. Uh, so, but then they somewhat shifted away. The, the Republicans started turning away from, you know, civil rights and black rights and even caring about them. And here along comes FDR and, and he is – offering them relief programs, okay? So black voters in the South turn their backs on the Republican Party because they're moving away from civil rights. And don't forget, they abandoned them after Reconstruction and left them hanging. I shouldn't say hanging, but you get my drift. So, And, and the blacks join the Democrats because the Democrats have the civil rights uh, person now, okay? Um, okay. And so, so what happens to the um, to the Democratic voters, the the white South, right? They're the Democrat, uh, the Democratic Party. Once the African Americans join the the Democratic Party, they all bail and go to the Republican Party. So, but both people just switch switch parties, okay? And the party names remain the same, but they completely change their ideologies. So, when a Republican today says that, 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 you know, I'm a Republican, I'm of the party of Lincoln. Not really. Okay, that, that's not really a true statement. Lincoln was, a, was in the party of civil rights and abolition. That would not be probably something the Republican Party would be a part of today, okay? Uh, so this is interesting. And, and then also Mexicans, Asians, most minority groups that have been oppressed or in, in American history – they permanently shift to the Democrats at this time, and it's still the case. Most most minority groups in America are, you know, typically support the Democratic Party, okay? Okay, so let me just kind of wrap this up, make sure we understand this. Between the end of the Civil War and 1936, okay, the Democratic Party of small government became the party of big government, and the Republican Party of big government became rhetorically committed to curbing federal power. So they swapped ideologies and completely changed their point of view. Okay, very interesting uh, development here in this in this uh, depression era. Okay. Okay, another another of, of uh, Roosevelt's acts was the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. Now we remember the, the natives had all their rights taken away. Uh, Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock. Remember, took away all the treaties. Whatever, whatever treaties we signed, they're they're done, null and void. We're starting. We can do whatever we want. Okay, take away the religion, land, culture. The you know we we saw we saw the uh, act that they they chopped the reservation up into smaller parcels and they ended up stealing some of the land. So that so the the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 gives the native people access to better education entrance to politics, they can bring their their own religion back, give them their lands back, reservation lands, mind you. Uh, yes, you can start practicing your culture again, you can use your language again, okay? Uh, so so they you know they they remained I'm sorry, they became a semi-sovereign state again and regained some religious freedoms, okay? 
Okay, like his fifth cousin, remember Teddy? They were they were related. Um, Teddy's the guy that got shot, but the show must go on. He kept on talking. Okay, FDR was also concerned with the environment, but then one of the negatives of his administration was the dust bowl that happened on his watch. Now we talked about the the Great Plains and how for centuries it was pristine with buffalo everywhere and the natives uh, hunting them, and, and you know not not a whole lot changing. You know, but in just a matter of a few decades, when the when the Europeans white Europeans came. They, they tore it up for, you know, for, for commerce and business and growing and, and you know, extracting resources. And so they, they abuse the land. OK, we, we talked about this earlier. So what happens after years of abuse and overuse of land? OK, the soil on top starts to become useless. You add a drought into that. And what happens is, is, the, is the top soil becomes like a powder. OK, four or five inches Thick. It's just powder. Then you have these windstorms that, 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 that happens in the uh, in the plains. Okay, uh, heavy winds strip the land of the usable soil. So all that powder was so easy to be stripped by the winds, and it all blows up into the air. Okay, and you have it looks like Armageddon, and these 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 clouds in the sky lasted for months, blotting out the sun. No water. So what happens to, to agriculture? It all it all dies out. You've got you've got no way to 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 grow crops. So if you're a farmer and you rely on crops for a living, what happens to you? You don't make any money. You can't pay your bills. You can't pay your mortgage. <clears throat> the bank foreclosed on your on your on your farm and you lose it. And this happens to you know everybody in the, in these areas. These are poor people. They don't have any any backup plan. Okay. So uh, all these people. Uh, found themselves with zero opportunity, had nowhere to go. So they left in mass and they went to California where they heard about potential jobs in the uh, fruit picking business, come out and be pickers in California. Okay, These people are called Okies. Why are they called that? Because most came from Oklahoma, uh, but it kind of came to be the catchphrase for anybody that came. Poor white farmers, with very little coming out in a beat up old truck with with you know their pots and pans hanging off the hanging off the truck their mattress on top and then their entire family in the back traveling across the entire country coming out to California for these jobs uh, and they they see flyers you know thousands of jobs jobs everywhere high pay they they get there much like the Europeans that immigrated you know earlier to the east coast the eastern cities they find there's not not quite the utopia that, that they were they were led to believe uh, not always what they expected jobs weren't plentiful at all so it sounds familiar it's it's the, it's the the same as the immigrants disappointment in opportunities and tenement lifestyles okay okay um, so this is an interesting interesting uh, time and it was memorialized in the book on the left called The Groups of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Okay, this is a very, very famous uh, American book. Many high schools uh, ask their students to read it. I read it in high school. Um, but then this is 1939, the book came out. And this is all about the Okies and their plight. Okay, The following year, uh, they made a movie about it, The Grapes of Wrath, uh, starring Henry Fonda, a very famous uh, actor of that era, all the way up into the 60s and directed by John Ford, a very famous director. So, the, so this movie becomes, you know, a very, very popular film of this era, okay? Uh, so what I want you to do, I want you to watch the last the last two clips here back to back, okay? The, the first one is called Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? So watch that one, and then watch the, the next one called The Grapes of Wrath, okay? Now the first one is looking at scenes from the movie as well as scenes from the uh, uh, the depression and the and the and the uh, the dust bowl and the whole thing and it's kind of uh, with, with a poem and a, and a song behind it you know brother can you spare a dime I'm I'm so destitute brother can you just give me a dime you know a, a, a dime would get me a, a sandwich and I, I could eat I could do something you know uh, and then the second one the grapes of wrath is, is kind of more about the film itself with lots of scenes from the movie so watch those two those two films back to back and then come back okay okay so that's that is all I've got for chapter 23 that is the story of the Great Depression okay so at this point now we are finished with the first half of the class and we now go into our midterm so the midterm is chapter 15 through 23 okay so I mentioned on the learning module that that by Thursday of this week 
I'm going to uh, post, um, I think that's the 14th, right? Um, uh, anyway, wh wh whatever Thursday is, I'm going to post the uh, study guide for the midterm uh, that I, that will be the next week. So I, I gave you the wrong date. So the, the week of 7-11 is the, is the uh, 7 9, I'm sorry, is the week of the midterm. 7 11 is the day of the midterm, okay? So I'm going to post this on the Thursday before that week. So you have, you know, almost a week to have it. What it, What is the study guide? It's it, I'm going to take all the terms that you've done, all those definitions for. You, you guys had so much fun doing that. I know you loved every minute of those definitions and key people. Learning, gaining, you love this stuff, okay? I'm going to take all of those terms and, and reduce it greatly so you don't have to study all of those for the, for the midterm. And I'll do, I'll do the same for the final. So I'm going to reduce that and, and reduce the people and give you a list of, of which ones, you know, will be on the exam. And then, of course, the, uh, the eight supplemental lectures. Now, um, you know, that you, that you do your, your uh, essay questions from. Now, I will... When I post the uh, midterm study guide next week, I, I will talk about it a little bit. I will I will go over, uh, I will spend a little bit of time with each supplemental lecture. You understand what I'm looking for. Uh, that typically is what people have the most questions about, of course, the terms, the people you've already done. So you, you already have, you know, a, a pretty good knowledge about all that, okay? Okay, so that's all I got for this uh, this week. Um, I I'm I, I mentioned in the uh, um, in the uh, welcome to week four video that this is a holiday week, so I'm not. This is all I'm going to do this week. This is probably you know maybe half of what we normally do, but I mean I'm thinking my other class you know gets a day off and it's the same class as what you're doing, but it's an in class class, so they get a day off. So why shouldn't we? You know. Why not us, right? So we're going to have um, – this week is not nearly as, as you know, large as the other weeks have been, okay? And that will give you time to finish the chapters, get your study guide, and study for your midterm, okay? The following week that the midterm is in, that will also be not a huge week. So you, so you have the first part of the week to, to study, get your, you know, act together for the midterm. That's on Wednesday, uh, the 11th. And then we're going to do, do just two chapters that week, 24 and 25. Then, of course, we get back into our, our normal routine, but we'll only have three weeks left, okay? So we're heading towards the, the, the end here pretty quickly. Uh, Eight-week classes go by fast, okay? Okay, that was a lot of information thrown at you one time. <laughs> Sorry about that. I hope that you absorbed all that. If you have any questions, please, like I always say, um, general questions, discussion board, Personal questions, send me an email. Thanks, guys. I'll see you.